Digital Daily, where we're seeing nature lectures every day. Um, there's loads more today. There's more tomorrow. For weeks to come, there's, you can actually find the one I did last time, which is all about the urban natural world, the, the wildlife you can find in cities, um, and, uh, on the little links below. Um, but this, um, uh, and yeah, so cities are really amazing places for wildlife. And hopefully, that's 50, we think two thirds of people are going to be living in cities. So we need our cities to be really great places for us to say before I quickly start this one is in this sort of difficult time that we're finding ourselves, we're really seeing communities come together. It, one thing that uh, uh, I think of when I, when I think of the word community is my friends, my family, but also the amazing, I think of the butterflies that are wafting around on the, on the, on the world, a more interesting and exciting place. Um, so over the next sort of 20 minutes or so, what I'm going to try and do is tell you three stories about skin enough to have a garden or your local in London, which is which is amazing. But that was a long, long time ago. But I actually think there is way to actually spend most of their time sleeping. And I'm going to try and introduce you to some of those incredible animals. The first one that I want to do or tell you about are these guys, the peckers. So we've got four types of woodpecker in the UK. We've got the green woodpecker, which is like a grassland species. A grassland species. We've got these guys, which are great spotted woodpeckers. This is a male, because you can see a little red patch on top of his head there. We've also got a lesser spotted woodpecker, which is a slightly um, rarer species. And also, the, the woodpecker that a lot of people forget about is a rhinec, which is a woodpecker that we rarely sort of see, but it has been found in London a few times. Uh, where, where it may have been like sort of September, when they're flying, when they're migrating from Scandinavia all the way down to Africa. And about sort of September time, you can sort of find them in our cities or, and our, 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 in, the, in the UK setting. But, um, yeah, so what I want you to do now is imagine that you are a woodpecker, okay? And what do woodpeckers do? They spend, they peck wood, right? So they spend most of their lives um, hitting their face against, like, tree trunks and stuff like that, which is absolutely, well, if you, if you imagine doing that, you're going to get a pretty, pretty bad headache, right? Because the incredible forces that are involved head against the tree is pretty pretty phenomenal. So these guys are amazingly, amazing, well, well adapted, evolved to, to peck wood. The first thing is that they have a really strong beak, uh, really, really strong to able to, to peck the wood. Their sort of bone structure is a, a bit spongy, so it can absorb the, um, the sort of high pressures. But it's most amazing thing, it, it wraps around the skull. So it's attached here to what's called the hyoid apparatus at the back of the skull. And then the tongue wraps around the whole skull and it sticks out like this. So is it, it works as like an internal shock absorber. So woodpecker skulls are absolutely amazing. Um, and so, uh, so why do woodpeckers peck wood? It's a good question. And there's sort of a few reasons for that. One is so that they can... Uh, Make holes in trees to lay their to lay their eggs. That's where they nest. They also um, peck uh, peck uh, woods, sort of mark their territories. The males will do it really loud. That's sort of marking their territories. But the most important thing is is how that they uh, they hunt. Are we struggling with the? We're having a bit of a poor connection. I'm just going to move the laptop. Okay, we'll try and move the connection back a little bit. The laptop back a little bit. Hopefully. Hopefully you can hear me. Okay, so you, can we see if that's working? Maybe. Well, we'll, we'll keep going. If it, well, if it doesn't work, no worries. Um, but we'll, I'll keep I'll keep cracking on and tell you about how amazing woodpeckers are. Um, so yeah, but the most important reason why they're trying to peck wood is to forage to find uh, beetle larvae predominantly that's hiding behind the bark of of, of trees and stuff like that. Um, and how they do it, so they peck the wood, and it's something called percussive foraging. There you go, do you want to take that? No, percussive, percussive foraging. And they're pecking the wood and they're trying to find like hollow um, hollow bits behind the wood where they can hear, hear the, uh, uh, the, the beetle behind the bark. So they know where to peck. Absolutely amazing. And unfortunately, this morning you're meant to hear a really cool lecture from Simon when he redoes it. But, um, uh, these, uh, he, he, would have told, he would have told you about eye eyes and they percussive forage in Madagascar with their long fingers. And these effectively are woodpeckers, our great woodpeckers, great spotted woodpeckers do the same. Um, so really interesting adaptation. The next animal I want to tell you about 
has actually a special relationship with uh, woodpeckers because woodpeckers help make their homes. So when woodpeckers build their hole, make their nests and do their holes, they'll never come back to that hole after they've laid their eggs. So then the wood is full of all these holes all over the place. So lots of things can go into those holes to live in. And one thing that definitely goes to live in those holes are bats, okay? So um, in the UK, we've got about 17 species of, of, of breeding bat. 11 of those can be found in London. Eight of them sort of roost in London. And these are, again, absolutely incredible predators. So as you know, they're nocturnal, so they come out at night. And you ever hear somebody saying, oh, you're as blind as a bat. That is actually one of the best compliments anybody can ever say to you, because bats actually have incredibly fantastic eyesight. Really, really, really good at night vision. They're really light sensitive. So actually light pollution is a really bad thing for bats because when you light up our night skies, all that bright light dazzles the bats and it makes them difficult to feed. So light pollution is really tricky when it comes when it comes comes to bats. Um, but their eyesight is not the main way in which they hunt. They use a special way, uh, like, like woodpeckers, they use sound to hunt and they use something called echolocation, okay? Echolocation is where the bat is putting out these really high-pitched sounds that we can't hear, but um, it's, saying that it's screaming out these high-pitched sounds and their sounds are bouncing back to the bat's big ears, and that helps. Like a submarine does um, its sonar, that sound bounces back off and then it uses the sound to create the picture, which is absolutely amazing. Every different species of bat has a slightly different frequency of, um, has a slightly different frequency of uh, echo of, of, of sound that it uses. So we can work out by listening to that sound what bat is flying around our, our night skies. Um, uh, yeah, so um, hopefully that connection's working now, is it? Oh, good, amazing. So, um, so each bat has a different location, a different sort of frequency that it uses. But one thing that I think really is amazing, so because the bat is having to put out these big, so imagine screaming out these big noises, what it does, when it's flapping its wings, and its wings come down, the, the pressure sort of increases inside its lungs, and that's how it increases the pressure to shout. So all of its screams, all of its echolocation beats are in line with its wing beats, because the wing beats increase the thoracic pressure inside the bat, which helps it make those big sounds. So amazing, amazing way in which, in which they can sense the landscape around them. And um, uh, but in, the animal world is like an arms race. You've always got predators and prey, and they're always trying to find different ways in which the uh, the, pr uh, the prey can escape the predator, and the predator can capture the, the prey. And the same is the same as with bats. So a bat can eat about three thousand insects in one night. So all these insects are trying to find ways in which they can escape bats. One of my favourite stories is about lace wings. So lace wings are amazing predators in their own right. They they live in our gardens. They're actually sometimes called aphid wolves or aphid lions in their larval stage um, because they eat so many aphids. So a gardener's best friend. Um, but when they're flying around in their adult form, they're good food for bats. But they're, so they're flying around as well. But they've got their ears, which are actually underneath their wings. And they're always listening out to the bat echolocation. So when they hear the bat echolocation, the lacewing will hear it, and then drop out the sky to try and escape. So an amazing sort of inter a relationship between the predator and prey. But though lace wings are incredible predators, they're not my next, well, uh, my next sort of hidden hunter, which I think actually is probably the best hunter on the planet. And that is no exaggeration. And that is these guys. So hopefully, now that camera's a bit far away, you can see it. So we're talking about our dragonflies. So hopefully soon our warm, sunny, so like spring and summer days, you might see our dragonflies flying around. The dragonflies have absolutely amazing, well, or they're amazingly well adapted. So dragonflies have been on our planet for an extremely, uh, amazingly long time. So if you go back that 300 million years to a time called the Permian or the Paleozoic, uh, that is when dragonflies sort of first started um, living um, on our planet, which is millions of years before the dinosaurs. And they haven't changed really in form in that 300 million years because they are so well adapted for their environment. And uh, you can do things in your garden to, 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 to bring, make it a really good habitat for, for dragonflies even now. 
So but if you were going to go get in a time machine and go back 300 million years, um, you would just, the dragonfly had a very, very close relative, which looked exactly like a dragonfly, looked exactly the same. The only bit that was different, that it was massive. It was about, had about a foot wingspan. And that dragonfly was probably the biggest dragon, uh, insect ever, ever to have lived on a planet, um, which is, imagine a dragonfly, which had a foot wingspan. Incredible. But they no longer exist, but we still have some incredible dragonflies that, um, uh, that, that live on, on, well, within the UK and around the world. In, in the UK, we've got about 57 different types of dragonfly and damselfly, okay? Dragonflies and damselflies, hopefully, you'll, um, I can tell show you some simple rules in which you can tell the difference between a damselfly and a dragonfly, okay? So, this, here we go, it's over here, is a damselfly, okay? So, we, so that, this is actually a, weg, a white-legged damselfly, and it's actually quite a rare species. I'm really happy to say we've got these recorded on our local river. Um, where we've one of the very few places in the whole of London where, they're, where they've been recorded. And you can actually, if you look in the drop down menu below, you'll see a whole little documentary about that river. And it sort of has great images of these guys flying around. But some simple rules to tell you the difference between a damselfly and a dragonfly. One is when they're perched on a, 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 a leaf or a twig like that, their wings fold behind themselves. Whereas when a dragonfly lands on a twig or something, its wings will stick out like this. So this is our largest dragonfly, called an emperor dragonfly. And you can see how its wings are sticking out. And you can also see that its body is slightly bigger in structure, a bit more chunky than your typical dragon uh, damselflies. Damselflies are typically a bit more fragile looking, and these guys are a bit more sturdy looking. But yeah. So that is a good way to tell the difference. The other way is their eyes. So dragonfly eyes wrap around their heads, whereas damselflies, they sort of stick out on stalks, a little bit like that. So if you ever see something, looking, um, looking how they're perched or looking at their eyes, that's a good way to tell the difference between a damselfly and a dragonfly. But the most incredible part of this animal's life cycle, in my opinion, is when it is what we call the nymph stage. And again, my amazing friend Tom has made me an awesome model of a dragonfly nymph. So dragonflies can live um, in the nymph stage about maybe two years, but if it's like in a really cold place, like bits of Scotland, they can actually live as a dragonfly in the, the, the nymph stage, maybe eight years, which is incredible. Um, and during this time, they're absolutely scary predators as well. So what they're called, they're called, we call them ambush predators. So when they're in their larval stage, they haven't got very good eyesight. So what they do, they creep behind um, little vegetation, and that is where they hunt. But I'll tell you more about how they hunt in a second. But uh, what I think is one of the most incredible part of these amazing hunters that we can find in our ponds is their bottoms. So their bottoms are absolutely incredible things. So they use them for sort of three reasons. One, a dragonfly larval boss, a nymph bottom is used for it to breathe. It's also used to be a bit like a jetpack. So what it'll do is suck in water and it will spur out water. As it spurts out the water, that is what propels it along um, underneath the water. But the most important thing, I think, how it always cool things, uh, it uses bond for, well, it, it helps power its projectile jaw or its labium, which is just the most amazing thing. So what these things do, when they're trying to hunt, they'll suck in water, and then they'll release that pressure that they've built up, and it will power a projectile jaw, which does this. And this goes so quickly, you can barely see it. You can't even really see it on like really slow motion video. But it fires this projectile jaw out of its mouth, and it'll grab even like small fish, invertebrates, and even things like um, uh, tadpoles and stuff. So these guys are absolutely amazing hunters. Um, but they, they hunt in a sort of ambush sort of way, which is amazing. But yeah, true aliens, and they do look like aliens. And um, if any of your like, moms and dads have seen the film Alien, which is a really good film, they actually base the alien in that film on one of these guys, because it has this projectile jaw. But, so even though it spends most of its life like this, most people know dragonflies when they're in their big adult stage. Oh, I'm gonna stand back over here a bit. But well, it's amazing how they get out of this. So after about two years or so, when the dragon, when the larva, when the nymph has thought, okay, 
I'm a bit bored of being a nymph now. I want to turn into a full-blown adult. I'm going to grow up and what he does, he'll climb a reed and then the nymph will gra gra grab onto the reed and then the, the, the actual body will burst out of the back of, uh, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the nymph and the adult will emerge from the back of the dragon of, of the nymph. So it emerges out and it pumps its wings up and then it flies away and it leaves the skin shell or the exuber of the dragonfly nymph behind. So if you ever go to a pond and you see some reeds hanging out of it, always look carefully for the dragonfly skins that they've left behind as they're going through that metamorphosis. But when they're actual adults, they're also really cool predators then too. Um, so the dragonfly adult has amazing eyes. As we saw earlier, they wrap around their body or wrap around their heads even. That means they can sort of see in 360. Um, which so they've got amazing eyesight, some of the best eyesight of any animal in, on the planet. Um, but one of the things that really distincts all our sort of dragonflies and damselflies is that they have teeth. And their Latin word is odonata. And that dent in the middle means teeth. So you go the dent, dent is in, you go to the dentist, that's where it comes from. So they're one of our only few insects to have teeth. So what they do, because they've got this amazing eyesight, is that so they can see in 360, but they have the most sensitive areas just above their head, just above here. So what they do, they'll fly low along the water. And when they see something that they want to eat, they'll go up like this. And that's quite, and then grab it and uh, attack it and use it, use their teeth to, to eat it. And that is that sort of way of pattern of flying low and going straight up is a bit like how sharks, sharks hunt. Um, so I like to see our dragonflies as sky sharks. And that's how I sort of, sort of imagine them. And they can also use their wings in amazing ways. They can actually change each of their wings, use each wing slightly differently um, at different times. They control each four wings independently, which again, absolutely blows my mind. So that was three different stories of three different um, uh, predators that we can find in our gardens and our urban parks that I think are just the most amazing predators on the planet. Sorry if there was connection difficulties, but let's see if we can answer some questions if there are any. Um, so a really interesting question from Emily D. Um, if bats live in woodpecker holes, does a bat population increase with an increase in woodpecker population? Oh, well, so bats are quite a lazy species, okay? So what they do, they never really make their own make their own sort of homes. They're not like birds that make nests. So bats, what they do, because they spend most of the time flying around, they don't spend much time actually building their homes. So what they do, they have to look around the landscape and see how where, where they can nest. They're always looking for little crevices, so they can even get behind bark, but woodpecker holes represent a really good opportunity for them to live in. So if you had lots of woodpecker holes, that would make it a better environment for the bats to live in. But bats can also live underneath tiles and people's roofs. They can also live in bits of crevices behind bark, or like little, in between bricks and all sorts of stuff. And now you can buy things like bat boxes and bat bricks, which makes it even better for bats to live in a special urban environment. But a really good question. Um, but bats can live, because they're so small, they can live in really small places. Um, is that, Does wood, do woodpeckers increase bat population? I suppose they'll live, if you had lots of woodpecker holes, that would make the habitat more uh, amenable, more better, uh, better, more 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 um, suitable for bats. So I suppose it, it definitely would it, it would make it more appropriate for bats to live there for sure. So it's a really cool interconnection between two different species. Um, amazing, cool. All right, so that's all the questions. Thank you so much for for listening in. Make sure you tune in to future. Oh, we've just had one more question. What's the best way to attract dragonflies to my pond? Ah, oh, well, dragonflies are somewhat, well, there's one species of dragonfly called a broad bodied chaser. And these are um, quite thick. The males have these beautiful blue color. And what they do, they'll see a pond because dragonflies can also see UV light. So they can sort of see where the ponds are without even being able to see the physical pond. They can see the light reflecting off it. So um, sometimes if you, if you spill the pond, it can just be a matter of days for a broad bodied chaser to show up because they're the first, they, they can fly around and they're looking for ponds. So just by having a pond will attract them. Um, in terms of what you can do to your pond, making sure you've got lots of nice sort of reeds and stuff like that for, uh, so, uh, uh, and underwater vegetation. So when they're going around as their nymph stage, they've got little habitats to hunt in and then they can crawl out of the nymphs, uh, uh, crawl up the, um, uh, the reeds to, to go for that metamorphosis. So nice, lots of different vegetation types are good ways to, to make your ponds better. Cool. Amazing. So make sure you tune in to all the, 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 the future uh, Earth Live lessons that are coming up. 
there's loads more today and some really good ones tomorrow. There's one by ZSL tomorrow, and I think ZSL is the Zoological Society of London, which is, I think, one of the best conservation organisations on the planet. So make sure you tune in to, to that one. Um, but remember um, to think, when you think of communities, think of not just your friends and your families, but all the amazing animal world that is around us as well. And um, yeah, thank you so much for listening, guys. Cheers. Bye for now. There we go. Thank you.